Um, all right. Is this is it is the volume okay? It's too loud. It's good. Everything's good. Okay. Good. Um, yes. So uh, last week we we introduced the concept of well we talked about passivity. What states are passive? We introduced the concept of majorization uh, right up to the Schuhorn theorem, um, which was essentially the statement um, that well. I'm going to put the statement that matters for us, which is that if rho is a density matrix, then the uh, vector of P, which is the diagonal elements in any basis, is majorized by the vector of eigenvalues. And then, as I said last time, this is particularly useful for us because when we do unitary operations, the eigenvalues are preserved. And so we have a statement that there is some vector that's set of the eigenvalues that majorizes whatever diagonal elements you have at the end of your operation. OK, now, uh, the first thing I want to do is, so I'm not going to go into the details of this proof. Um, honestly, just the wiki page of Schuon theorem, a couple of paragraphs, you see it's quite clear. Um, it, it comes from the fact that essentially the unitary operation is sort of the quantum generalization of a doubly stochastic matrix. So when you look at a unitary operation, but then you say, well, I don't care, I just look at the relationship between the eigenvalues and the diagonal elements, what you get is you get a sub subset of that information of the unitary operation, and it becomes a doubly stochastic matrix, essentially. So put it this way, if you take the you take a unitary operation and you take each element ij and you mod squared this, you define a new matrix from that, that's doubly stochastic because every column uh, and every row of a unitary matrix is uh, normalized, which means the sums of those squares are going to be one. So that's where it comes from. Okay, what I want to do first of all is to revisit the statement about passivity that I made last lecture uh, from intuitive arguments about qubit subspaces once we know this. Because what we were talking about with passivity was saying, well, we take rho, and I want to go to any unitary operation, so u rho u dagger, which I call rho prime. And I want to minimize the energy of this. So I go, let me minimize over all unitaries of um, yeah, uh, the trace of h rho prime. Okay, that, that's my question, because if I want to extract energy, it's the same thing as saying this. If I want to minimize the energy of the final state, that's, mini well, that's minimizing this quantity. And this I can also write now in the energy basis as minimum of um, basically sum over n, pn prime, en, where these are the energy eigenvalues. These are the populations in the, in the energy basis, which, again, is minimum of, like, I'm going to write it in just vector form. P prime, P prime, okay? Um, but what is this? We know that the initial eigenvalues, so if I call them lambda prime and the final eigenvalues, these are the same. So all of the eigenvalue vector just remains the same. And every, ele every diagonal element vector is majorized by that one, which now we use the, um, the statement about doubly stochastic matrices, and I get minimum over, so this was minimum over U, I could call this minimum over Pn prime, the collection. This is minimum over P prime. And this now becomes minimum over doubly stochastic matrices of D um, acting on lambda dot E. Okay. Ah, sorry, there's no prime of the E. Yeah, E is just, sorry, I meant to write that. E is the energy eigenvalues. That's, that's the same always. Thank you. Um, yes, and now recall from the last week's um, discussion about linear optimization. So first of all, from Birkhoff von Neumann, we can, well, we can write this as sum over n, sum cn times the permutation n. So let me just call these pn acting on lambda and then dot E. But then we, as we discussed with linear optimization, 
when you want to, this is now a linear function, of course, because it's, it's a dot product. So when you want to optimize this over a convex combination of, of permutations, you simply pick the best one. So you go, this is going to be minimum over all n of pn lambda dot e. So one of the extreme points, which are the permutations, is going to give you your extremum values. One will give you a min, one will give you a max. Of course, it may not be only one when they are, if the eigenvalues have lots of degeneracies, then multiple ones might give you the same just because multiple permutations might give you the same answer. But essentially, there's, it's going to be one of the permutations that gives you uh, the minimum of this. And then, of course, as we discussed, it's very clear what that permutation is. If you, if you write the eigenvalues as a list, and you want to minimize the energy, you just put the maximum eigenvalue in the lowest energy, and so on and so forth. So this now already tells us that our guess for what, passive, what states are passive is correct. Because as we said last time, I said, well, a state is passive if it's diagonal uh, in energy, and its eigenvalues are ordered in decreasing order. And this already fits that description. I'm, there's no permutation on such a state that would lower the energy already, because it's already the case that the uh, diagonal elements are the eigenvalues. Um, the only thing left to say that that's the only states that are passive is the statement that, and this is something I'm not going to prove exactly, but I'm going to state it. And uh, it, it's the statement that if, so if rho is not diagonal, then the vector of populations is, and now I'm just going to write this, down here saying strictly majorize by lambda. So majorization in general is a, is a majorize or equivalent. But we have the statement that if I have a density matrix of any matrix, essentially, which is not diagonal, and I look at the diagonal elements, they are not going to be the eigenvalues. They are strictly majorized. And the reason for this is the, the argument, if you wanted to prove this, is just from the qubit subspace argument. So imagine that you have such a density matrix. You just pick one of the off-diagonal elements, and you do the rotation in that qubit subspace. And you will see that you can make, one of, you can make the larger one of the diagonal elements even larger. And so you can make it a, a vector that majorizes the original one. So that's where the argument comes from. And so you see now, from this perspective, what, um, well, the whole notion of passivity. Are there any questions? Good. So now we move on to the thermal state from three different ways. The first way is going to be the notion of complete passivity. So what is complete passivity? Um, it's the same as specificity, but I'm allowed to now use multiple copies of a system. So I go rho is completely passive if for all n we have that uh, the minimum over unitaries of u, and I'm going to write this u n, rho n copies, u n dagger. Well, actually, here the n is not required. It's just a unitary on everything. So ta -da. let's put h here. h n, that's where I require the n. u, u dagger um, is, well, this minus that is equal to 0, or I can just say this is equal to the, the um, energy of the initial state. So hn, rho tensored n, I think. Um, and to clarify, h is just, it's a sum of many systems, so it's just, it's just a sum Hamiltonian. So it will be of the form, so the same h on the first particle, tensor identity on the rest, plus identity on the first particle, tensor h, tensor identity, plus, and so on and so forth. It's a sum Hamiltonian. Okay. So a completely passive uh, state, it's, it's a stronger version of passivity because, of course, if this is true for all n, then in particular it's true for n is equal to 1, which is the original passivity statement. So if, if a state is completely passive, then it's clearly also passive, but the vice versa does not hold. And now what we're going to do is we're going to argue that, in fact, the only state that is completely passive, if rho is equal to e to the minus beta h upon the normalization for some 
beta. Okay. So this is now isolating the Gibbs states from among all of the others. All right. So. How are you going to do that? They're going to do that using the language of virtual qubits. So imagine now, so of course, in order to prove this, um, we have to do it two ways. So first way is to say that this is completely passive. The fact that this is completely passive is, um, is very clear. Uh, the reason being that, OK, this, is, this state is already diagonal in energy, of course. So rho is equal to sum over n e to the minus beta e n e n e n upon z. So it's diagonal energy. It's passive. And now what happens when you take compositions of this? So our main goal now is to say that, um, ah, actually, let me put it this way. The statement that rho is completely passive is somehow saying that for every n, the original passivity argument holds. Because this is, this is simply the original passivity argument, but now it's on n copies. So all we have to check to see that rho is completely passive is saying no matter how many copies of n, that state that we get is still passive. So now what happens when you have n copies of such a state? First of all, we can still argue that rho tensor n is diagonal in energy. This is clear if you have a. Um, Diagonal with respect to, well, I just say diagonal is always with respect to energy if I don't say anything. If you have a diagonal matrix and you multiply it together, you still get uh, a diagonal matrix. So, so that part is still true. All we have to check, therefore, is that the energy eigenvalues are still ordered in terms of decreasing order. So we have to check, basically, that when we have a high energy state and a low energy state in the composite system, it still is the case that the, the low energy has the bigger population. And this is true because of the special property of the Gibbs ratio. When it composes, it remains the Gibbs ratio. So let's imagine that we have, um, uh, let's take a composition of states. So let's take n1 tensor, n2 tensor, something, something until, well, maybe not n. So we have n. So let's take this m, m2 tensor something. So that's one state. So m n, and the other state will be L1 tensor L2 tensor dot, dot L n. And so this is now two energy eigenstates in the composite system. So what is the population of this state? It's going to be proportional. So, the, so this P here, let's call this P the M thing, is going to be proportional to E to the minus beta. And then you have the sum of all of the energies. So EM1 plus EM2 dot, dot, dot. And this population here, PL, is going to be e to the minus beta EL1 plus EL2 plus dot, dot, dot. And so the ratio of these populations, PM by PL, is going to be proportional to e to the minus beta. And I'm just going to call this E of the M state minus E of the L state. And this is exactly, again, the Gibbs ratio. So I mean, this is kind of almost trivial. It's just that the Gibbs ratio, an exponential, exponential ratio like this under composition remains, like retains the fact that it's still a Gibbs ratio. Uh, just to clarify, I forgot to say that. So the, the temperature has to be positive, because as we discussed, if the temperature is negative, you actually have an inversion. You have higher populations in the high energy state. So um, you would, of course, then be able to extract energy. OK, so oh, I have to complain about this. It's still broken. Um, so now let's do it the other way. So the other way is slightly tricky. Now we have to show, imagine I have a state. It is passive, but it's not completely passive. Um, I have to somehow, well, sorry, that it's, that it's not essentially the thermal state. That's not the Gibbs state. I have to show that it is not completely passive. At some point, if I have enough copies, I'm going to be able to extract energy from that. And this is where the language of virtual qubits is useful for us. So imagine I have some Hamiltonian of this form. Uh, and what I do is I say, this is not completely passive. Okay? So the fact that it's not completely passive, so rho not Cp means it's not equal to e to the minus beta h by z. 
which in turn means that there exists, there exists, there exists um, two transitions, so two transitions, and by transitions I mean pair of energy levels. So these are two transitions, are two pairs of energy levels with different beta virtual. So when I take the state row, I can look at each transition and I can look at the virtual temperature of that transition to see, well, with respect to that population, what does the temperature look like? The fact that it's not a thermal state means there must be at least two transitions that have different beta v. Because if that was not the case and every transition had the same virtual temperature, then that would mean it is a thermal state. Because that's the only state that has all of the ratios being the, the Gibbs ratio with the same temperature. So what I do is I simply pick that. So I, I pick, let's say, this is transition one, and this is transition two. There's my transition one and transition two. And now I'm going to, let's use the same notation in my notes so that I can just follow them. So I, J, K, and L. So let's call this I, J, K, and L. OK? And now we are going to take rho tensored with itself m plus n. So we're going to take m plus n copies of this. And in that, we're going to look at two energy levels. So we're going to look at the following energy levels. So the first one is j tensored m tensored l tensored n. So m times j in that one. And the other one is going to be, uh, oh, sorry, this is I L. It should be, t -t -t yeah, sorry, I. I apologize. This one is J tensored M tensored K tensored N. OK? And now what I want to do is I, j I want to understand everything about the relationship between these two. So first of all, so let me draw a line here. So. First of all, the energy of this, so let me call this E2, is going to be m times the energy of this, n times the energy of this. So this is m e i plus n e l. Let me call this E1 the same way, m e j plus n e k which together gives me that delta E of the full thing is going to be m times EI minus EJ plus n times EL minus EK. Okay. Um, so let me just now, for shorthand, write this as m delta. So that's, yeah, min, let's put a minus so that J is, yeah, so minus m delta ij, so whenever I write, so delta xy would be ey minus ex, so the second one is the, the high one, and then plus n delta kl. Okay, that's our, that's our energy gap between these two energy levels. And now I want to look at the population between them. So I say, well, what is the population? Now, if I write directly the population of one of them and the population of the other, I will have a proportionality with the partition function and stuff. But what I can do is I can be clever. I can just directly write down the ratio of populations of both of them. So I write P2 upon P1. And what is this going to be? Well, this is a product of many density matrices, so the populations are also going to be products. So I can look at the ratios of every one of the, the ratios that are contributing to the product and just multiply them together. So first of all, I'm going to have m times this ratio. So I'm going to have pi by pj. And this is going to be a m times in this, product, in this product. And then I'm going to have pl by pk. And this is going to appear n times. That's good. And now I use the fact that, uh, oh, that became loud all of a sudden. 
not sure how. Uh, I use the fact that, well, I, I'm going to associate now virtual temperatures with these. So I'm going to call the virtual temperature of this one beta ij, the virtual temperature of this one beta kl. It's obvious uh, notation. And this is going to give me e to the minus, now m is, is a, out, on the outside of the exponent, so it just multiplies the exponent, m times beta ij, so plus delta ij. Now, the reason it's plus is because delta ij, remember, is ji, so it's the energy of j minus the energy of i, and here I have the Gibbs ratio written as pi upon pj. Okay. Same with the other one, e to the minus n in this case, beta kl, delta kl. All right, so that's fine. So I don't have to simplify that anymore. I have that. And now, well, I have two energy levels in the composite system, so I can define a virtual temperature on them as well. And what is that? So this, so P2 by P1, I can also just define a virtual temperature. I call this E to the minus beta 1, 2, just obvious notation, times the energy gap. And the energy gap is this one here. So N delta KL, let me write it at N, minus M delta IJ plus N delta KL. And this now, if I equate, gives me what I'm looking for. So I equate these and get rid of the exponent, and I have that beta ij, oh, sorry, beta 1, 2, so I'm solving for this, is equal to m beta ij delta ij minus n beta kl delta kl upon m delta ij minus n delta kl, okay? Looks very similar to the previous expressions for virtual temperature that we have, and this now I can simplify beta ij delta ij minus n over m beta kl delta kl, and the same thing in the denominator, delta ij minus delta kl. And why have I done this? I've done this for a very simple reason. In the individual states, knowing that they are passive, we had that the energies must, uh, the eigenvalues must decrease with energies. So you, you don't have an inversion. And the point is, if we are going to prove that this is not completely passive, it must mean that at some point we get an inversion. Because it's always going to remain diagonal, so the only way it cannot be passive with some composition is if suddenly at some point we find, oh, there's a higher amount of population at a, at a higher energy. And that is the same as proving that a virtual temperature has become negative. Because the moment we have an inversion of populations, then picking those two energy levels, we see the virtual temperature is negative. So our goal here is to say that we can always pick beta 1, 2 to be negative. And looking at this expression, it's quite simple. So this expression here is going to be 0 for some value of n over m. So there is some, so there is some, uh, oh, write it the same way. There exists some, let's say, R1, such that beta ij, ij delta ij, minus r beta kl delta kl is equal to zero. And the same way there exists r2 such that the bottom is zero. They are not the same. They can only be the same r if beta ij was equal to beta kl, in which case we've picked two transitions that have the same virtual temperature. So of course, we're not going to get anything interesting. But we know, we are guaranteed that we can pick two different virtual temperatures. So these are not going to be the same. And the point is, sorry? Oh, sorry. R, R, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. That's why I made this mistake, because I suddenly lost the N over. Yeah, sorry. I just divided denominator and numerator by the same thing. Yeah. So if I, if I plot these two expressions with respect to R, they're just linear expressions. So with R, they're just straight lines. And there is one point at which one changes sign and the other point at which another changes sign, which means that there's going to be some interval in between where this expression is going to be negative. I'm guaranteed that because R1 and R2 at the point which they change sign are different. So there exists, so that means, and this is R2, let's say R2 not equal to R1. So this means there exists some interval where it's negative. 
So where so R is sort of within some interval that's I don't know which one will be larger or smaller, let's just call it A B some interval there. Oh, it's going to be an open interval, let's say. And that completes the proof because one of the fundamental things in number theory is if you have two integers n and m, you can make the ratio between these two integers as close to any real number as you like. So as long as you know this interval, you just pick some number in this interval, you pick n and m close enough to that number, it will be in this interval, and you will get a negative thing. Of course, if the number, if the interval gets smaller and smaller, these integers that you'll have to pick will become larger and larger, which is the same as saying, oh, I'll need more and more states to actually get this thing. Uh, and that will happen if the betas are close. So the closer betas get to each other, the closer R1 and R2 will be, and therefore the, the more states you will need in your composition before your final inversion. And so this completes the proof that if rho is not a thermal state, so now we have the statement, if rho is not equal to e to the minus beta h by z, then rho is not completely passive. Okay. Are there any questions? None? Okay. Now, um, so up to now in the course, well, with the exception of this calculation, we've taken the thermal state as something predefined. So we defined, oh, the Gibbs state, it's the thermal state. And we define temperature from that and stuff. So the purpose of this lecture actually is now to place this on a very firm footing. It's like, why is the thermal state special? And in the course of this lecture, starting with what we've just done, we're going to look at it from three perspectives. So the first is sort of a resource perspective, which is to say the thermal state is, well, useless is a very strong word, so let me just say, uh, well, resource-free. The second perspective will be an info-theoretic perspective, which is, say, the thermal state, uh, I'm just going to call it tau. Tau has minimal information. And the last one is from typicality and, well, there are two ones, actually, but I club them together, typicality and equilibration, which is the dual statements that tau is the expected state and tau is the state evolved to, loosely speaking. So these are four ways of doing this. Now, the first way that we just did is to say the thermal state is resource-free. And why do I say that? Well, remember the whole point about passivity is, can you extract energy from this state? So now when we have the thermal state, we say, well, it's completely passive, which means that no matter how many copies of the state we have, we are not going to be able to extract energy. And this is actually very much the, this, this version of the, the second law. Because remember what the second law says, one of the versions of the second law is you cannot convert heat into work. So if we go, well, let me define, so define the energy in tau or energy exchanged with thermal state. So energy exchanged with the Gibbs states, let me call this, Gibbs states. So to be heat, and then at the same time, so this is one, and two is I say energy change via unitary operation, U, to be work. Then this gives us that, so heat cannot be transferred into work. Because if I have as many copies of a thermal state as I like, all of the energy in that cannot be extracted by a unitary operation. I can only add energy to, a, to many copies of a thermal state. I can never extract energy. So this is the first version of saying, well, the thermal state is clearly special because resource-wise, when it comes to extracting energy, it, well, you cannot extract anything. So it's free in that sense. Next. 
15. What's the second way? Information theoretic. And so now we're going to talk about Jane's principle. OK. Um, thanks to E.T. Jane's, somewhere in the 50s. Um, and what is Jane's principle? So we are used to describing the state of a system by some parameters. So in quantum mechanics, we say, oh, we have a we have a density matrix, or we have a pure state, and generally a density matrix. But here's another perspective about looking at things with respect to information. Imagine that there is a quantum system, and I didn't tell you its state, like I didn't tell you the usual thing you're used to, like density matrix, but I tell you some property about it. So the traditional one in thermodynamics is, well, I know the average energy of the system, but that's all I know. So I, I have a system, it has a Hamiltonian, and this is its average energy. And then you're asked, well, what can you expect? from the state. So you, you, you now want to do something with the system, but in order to do something or to make calculations or any predictions, you have to allot some state to it. You have to say, well, okay, I'm going to assume the density matrix is something. And Jane's principle is a very simple one. It basically says, well, if you have partial information about the system, then the state that you assign to it has to be the one that has minimum extra information. So it, you do not want to add anything. So you have to sort of minimize the information you have the only thing, keep, keeping the only thing being the one thing that you've been told or the, the information you've been given. And what does this um, correspond to technically? Well, one of the ways of classifying the uncertainty in a state is by its entropy. The more the entropy in the state, the more, inf well, the more the information you require to complete sort of the description of the state. So a pure state has zero entropy because you cannot, well, you know the maximum amount of information you, you can have about it. The maximally mixed state has the maximum entropy because you have complete uncertainty about it. So Jane's principle on a technical level is, so if you know something about the system, what you do is, so you maximize the entropy S over all rho such that, so this, whatever statement on rho is true. So I, I don't know how to write a logical statement, so let's just write wow, some statement F on rho is true. So you have some constraint in a system, which is written by some statement f, and you keep that thing true, but you vary over all of the density matrices you have that are consistent with that statement. And among those, you pick the one with the maximum entropy. Because what you've done with that is you've said, well, I've minimized the information I have about the state, other than knowing something like that. Okay? So that's Jane's principle. And so. The trivial version of Jane's principle is, imagine that I know nothing about the state. Nobody gives me any information. What do I say the state is? Well, that is very clear. It's just the maximally mixed state. So I maximize the entropy, and that's maximally mixed. Sorry? Oh. Uh, sorry, yeah. I have to do, 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 do. Maximize, sorry. Yes. Maximize S rho over rho such that. Thank you. <laughs> maximize the entropy of that, and then the, the argument of the answer is essentially the density matrix you're looking for. OK, so if no information, then rho is the maximally mixed state. So in dimension d, this is identity over d. What happens if you have partial information? So the most interesting thing for us, which again will lead us to the thermal state, is imagine that we know the average energy. This is our, our second thing. So we know that trace of the Hamiltonian times rho is equal to a certain number. So we could call this yeah, the usual E average. And we know nothing else. So now we have to maximize the entropy, given that we know that the trace of the Hamiltonian is E average. Okay? What state are we going to get? So, so I'll write again the same thing here. So maximize. S of rho over rho 
such that trace of h rho is equal to E average. Okay? And I am going to prove that this is now again the Gibbs state. The first thing that we can prove is that this must be diagonal. So rho must be diagonal in energy. So it's actually even stronger. It must be diagonal in, in any basis of any energy basis. Which means even if you have, so if you have degeneracies in energy, of course, there exists multiple bases for energy. But no matter what you pick, rho has to be diagonal in that. Well, I'm just about to argue about this. So yeah. And, and the statement is, is very simple. So, so imagine that this is not true. So imagine, so take, um, take rho to be not diagonal. So rho is of, of some form, something like this. And you have your populations, Pn. And let's say you have something here. Let's call this Cnm. So you have Pm here and Cnm star that are not 0. Okay, so here's it, and this is all in the energy basis. So imagine that I do the following. I just set off diagonal to 0. So I transform the matrix by saying, well, I keep all of the populations the same, and I just leave the, all of the off diagonals are 0, so with En and Pm here. Now, what's happened here? So I have rho, and this is now, this is equal to rho prime. The point about these two is, because I've left the populations the same, the energy has stayed the same. So I, I have that um, trace of h rho is equal to trace of h rho prime. Okay? So I'm assuming that my, my state that maximizes this is my original state. And now I've gotten another one that has the same energy, so it still satisfies my, my constraint. But the problem is, the entropy is going to be bigger. And at this point is where I regret the fact that I did not do sure concavity before I switched. But let me uh, talk about that now. So the first thing I can say is the energies are the same. The second thing I can say is that, so in this case here, the eigenvalues of rho prime are literally the diagonal elements. But in this case, the eigenvalues are the eigenvalues of this ma density matrix. So what I have is that the eigenvalues of the state rho must majorize, so the eigenvalues of the state rho, we know from just looking at this density matrix, they majorize the diagonal elements, P, which in turn is equal to the eigenvalues of the final thing, lambda of rho prime. So the eigenvalues of the initial density matrix majorize the eigenvalues of the final density matrix. And this in turn has the uh, effect that the entropy of rho prime must be less then the entropy, and this is strict, by the way, because again, with the off-diagonals, it's always strict, and it's also less than S of rho. 10.23, so I still have seven minutes. Okay, why is that the case? Let me just briefly mention something about sure convexity and concavity. And this is something about majorized vectors. So a function f of um, v, where v is a vector, is, let's call it so sure, convex if um, a majorizing b, a majorizing b implies that f of a is greater than f of p. Okay? So con sure convexity and concavity is just sort of a, a nice way of saying a function is, the function obeys a majorization order. So if you have a majorization order, you will have, yes? Yes, yeah, so this is, f of v is sure co convex if this is true, and indeed, and then if I say for sure concavity, so sure concavity, is where A majorizing B implies F of A is less than F of P.
No, so row prime is not the more mixed state. Uh, sorry, row is, sorry, yeah. Row, row is, row prime is the more mixed state. Oh, sorry, what did I, uh, yeah, 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 no, no, I did, this was supposed to be this. I, I was thinking that because this has more entropy, that's the whole point, but uh, I wrote it the opposite. I apologize, yeah, I was wondering, yes, indeed. Um, yeah, the, the vector of, here the vector of eigenvalues majorizes the vector of eigenvalues here, so therefore the entropy here is less than the entropy there, indeed. And that's important to us, and the reason is because now what we've done is we've proven a contradiction. We started with a state that satisfies our maximization, we took the state, we made a transformation that kept the energy the same, so that's also a state that satisfies the constraint, but it has a higher entropy, which means that it, it clearly beats the original state of the maximization. Contradiction, and the only way to take care of the contradiction is to say, well, you cannot have off-diagonal elements to start with. Okay, so, yeah, sure convexity and concavity is, is very nice. Um, before I come back to this, let me say about sure convexity and concavity. So, there are a number of things. Um, that a number of useful things that are, are included here. So, for instance, the entropy is sure concave. Then the max element is sure convex. So if you take two vectors and if, if A majorizes B, then you're guaranteed that the largest element in A major is greater than the largest element in B. This follows from majorization. And then the min element is sure concave for a similar reason. You take the partial sum of everything except for the last element and you'll get that one. Um, and when you have a particular ordering, so this is just on the vectors themselves, but now if I associate the vectors, um, if I take the the, um, the vector of population, so I say, well, one of them is the population in the energy, in the energy eigenvalues, and another one is another set of populations, uh, and I have that one of them majorizes the other together with the fact that they're passive. So if, so let's say row one and row two are both passive, same Hamiltonian, okay, and, sorry, and row one, majorizes row two. So when I say row one majorizes row two, I mean lambda of row one majorizes lambda of row two. Then you can also say that the average energy, E average of one, will be less than E average of two. So essentially when you combine passivity together with uh, majorization, you, you get a thermodynamic order. Because now I'm, with the, all of this I'm saying, if I have two states that are both passive, same Hamiltonian, and one of them majorizes the other, that one is going to have the greater ground state population, the lower entropy, the lower average energy. So it really, in, even though they are not thermal and you can't associate a temperature, in every way that sort of, in almost every way that matters, you say that one is colder than the other. There is one exception, which is that we haven't defined this formula yet, but you've of course seen the free energy is not sure convex or concave. So that's the one, one exception to this uh, show convexity and concavity. Okay, so then coming back now to our thing about Jane's principle. Um, what we've argued is that the state, if it satisfies Jane's principle with the constraint that the average energy is known, it must be diagonal in energy. Um, and note, I really go, it must be diagonal, which means that Imagine that you had um, sort of block diagonal with respect to energy, but there was a degeneracy in energy, so you had a subspace where you could rotate, so you could get then another off-diagonal element. That would also not work, which means that if you have any, any energy subspace where it's degenerate, it's not only diagonal there, but it has to be proportional to the identity there. It has to be the same number on all of those elements, because then if you rotate, you, you get nothing. That it becomes proportional to the identity, which never gets rotated to anything else. So that's the first step. And now, of course, the second step is to say, well, not only is it diagonal, but it has the populations that are given by that. Let me briefly describe the, uh, the sort of way you do that. that. I mean, that one is very simple. I now start by saying rho is diagonal, so I can write it as sum over Pn En. And now I want to maximize the entropy. Because it's diagonal, I'm maximizing really the Shannon entropy in that basis. So sum over minus Pn 
log Pn over n. This is what I want to maximize. And so that you do it the typical way. You, Lagrangian optimization is the usual way to do it. So you just say, I define a Lagrangian L, um, which is equal to, sorry, the, the action, sorry. So this is the action, which is equal to what I want to maximize. So minus n pn log pn. And then I have some constraints. I have two constraints when I'm doing this on a density matrix. The first thing is that it has to be normalized. So sum over n pn, this has to be 0. And the second thing is the constraint of the average energy. So minus lambda 1, sum over n pn en minus e average. And that's our thing. And then I've run out of space, but I'll write this in, in red. You just go derivative of the action with respect to pn must be 0. And this will give you, with your lambda naughts and lambda ones, you essentially get that pn must be proportional to e to the minus some parameter. So I'm just going to write it as some, probably lambda 1 or plus or minus lambda 1, but some parameter beta times en. And then, of course, by normalization, you get that the proportionality constant has to be the partition function. And so at the end of it, you see that the, the state which maximizes the uh, entropy for a given average energy is a Gibbs state. And of course, beta here, when you do it this way, this beta is going to be a function of what that E average is. So and it's going to be, a well, not a very pleasant function, but it's going to be some function about this. The last comment to make is that, in fact, this also goes the other way around. Imagine that you said, I have a state, and I know what its entropy is, and I want to minimize the energy. So you either know the energy and maximize the entropy, or you know the entropy and you minimize the energy, you will also get a thermal state. So, and, and, um, and these actually, oh, a bit late with this, but these actually give two ways of, if I, had a, if I have a system and it's not thermal, there are sort of two thermal states that are related to the, to the uh, let's say, the innate properties of the system. And it is something I would revisit when I talk about thermalization, equilibration, and so on. Um, because I can have rho. And I know two things about rho. I know E average, which is equal to trace of H rho. And I also know S, which is minus trace of rho log rho. And so I can define two thermal states. So I can define, let's call it tau min with respect to rho. And this is basically, um, this is the state that, so minimum uh, of E, so minimum of trace H rho. No, no. Why do I do this? Tr minimum of this thing. <laughs> Sorry. Trace of H rho over all rho, such that S of, um, is that a, is that S, no, let's, let's put a different one. Eta, eta, so that eta is equal to S of rho. And then I can define a tau max of rho, which is the one we just did, max over eta of S of eta, such that trace of H eta is equal to trace of H rho. This one is a higher temperature than this one, and they basically give you in some sense, intuitive bounds on what the temperature properties of the state you can expect to be because they're with, between these two um, for, some, for some arguments. I will return to this in thermalization and equilibration. OK, so at this point, I will take a break, and we will continue at 40 past, so in five and a half minutes. So. Is there a quick question? No, I'm right. Yes. Um, if anyone wants to show their computer screen. Yes. Yeah. Um, it would be amazing if I could see the screen because I'm going to be using the I and L interface. So can you use I, I J? So it's I and J and K and L. Okay, because the, the arrows in the diagram where that two units of rows is open, but I think that the interface is using two units of rows. Uh, well, or maybe maybe they don't. Maybe I'm just thinking out loud. 
because they were alternating, but yeah. it was I and, yeah, it's I and J. Yeah. And Kenneth, yeah. Okay, then. yeah. No, no worries. Mm -hmm. Majorization. Uh, yes. Ah, that might I have not never I've not heard of that, but maybe this the version, this notion of peaked is related to majorization because indeed, one of the things that you're guaranteed when one vector majorizes the other is that the properties are concentrated more, which corresponds to being peaked and stuff. So it may be that they are related, but. Um, yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. So uh, in a way, like the sense of majorizing something, mm -hmm. the probability um, is higher for low energy squares. Yes. I mean, that's in addition to majorizing, that's also passivity. But just majorization, what it means is that as you look at the highest probabilities in each of the two vectors, in every subspace that you pick, you have that one of them has more than the other. So, so indeed, I mean, I would suggest that you look at the actual definition of peaked and maybe just go peaked and majorization, and maybe there's a one-way direction or the other, or maybe they're slightly inequivalent, but yeah. unclear enough. I would also add that majorization itself can be generalized a little bit to the concept of, so for example, in thermodynamics, you have beta majorization, where rather than just look at the things themselves, you look at them with respect to a distribution. So for example, with respect to the Gibbs state. So in that case, Normal majorization becomes looking at it with respect to the maximally mixed distribution, which is the free state under majorization. It's the one that you, is majorized by everything else. But you, have, you can have majorization with respect to another free state or free distribution, and then you get the notion of beta majorization. I don't, we will not get to this in this course, but it's for quantum thermodynamics, it's kind of very relevant. So, yeah. Okay, so let me erase from here. And now, so let's continue. The rest of this lecture is going to be about typicality and equilibration. Now, in, um, in this part of the lecture, it's more of a, a descriptive part in the sense that I will talk about these theorems that, are, that prove statements in, about typicality and equilibration in the quantum regime. But we will not go, oh, let me leave that. We will not go into the details of the proof because that's a whole other topic. Um, but, okay, so um, what is the notion of typicality? And let's also look at classical versus quantum. Ah, okay, there is a term that is not coming to mind, but probably one of you will realize it when I start speaking about this. So the notion of typicality is essentially if I, if I have a system, and especially a system that is part of a, another larger global system, then what can I expect the state or the description of the smaller thing to be? Okay? Um, and this is something that's actually fundamentally different in the classical case and in the quantum case. And the reason is the following. So in the classical case, uh, the notion of full information is the same as knowing everything, so it makes the system deterministic. So if I have a, a return to the original example at the beginning of the lecture, if I have a box of, um, let's say, a, a, a gas, so I have a, this, whole, this whole room is a larger system, and then this, a small part of the thing, like I place a box here, is a smaller system. And imagine I say, well, I know full information about the state of everything in this room. Well, that means I know the up to all of the microscopic constituents, it's deterministic. So in particular, I will also have complete information about the state of the smaller system in front of me. So in classical thermodynamics, if I want to get a typicality result, I usually need an extra assumption, which is of the following form. I say, well, I have the, the big um, 
uh, say, the, the, the big system, which is the air in the room. And I don't know everything about it. I know, let's say, again, it's average energy of the whole thing. And then the, the statement typically goes, well, we assume that the state somehow makes its way in phase space through all of the states that are consistent with this constraint. Forget what the term for this precise thing is. It's the equi well, equiprobable assumption. Uh, so I mean, it's that you, you're essentially given a constraint, you, your, your state will sort of make its way through this full phase space. And then when you have that, you see that your, your state of your smaller system is then this thermal state or the equilibrated state that you expect. Because given all of the different macro states that are, well, given all of the micro states possible with the same average energy, well, then you will have that the average state of the little system is going to be uh, equilibrated state and stuff. So you need, you essentially, you need this equiprobable assumption on the, on the big space. And one of the powerful results of quantum thermo is that this becomes irrelevant in the quantum case. And the reason for that is precisely because information in the quantum case is different. So the notion of full information is, well, there's no such thing as full information. There's the maximum information you can have about a quantum state. And that's to know it's, that it's in some pure state, some state in a Hilbert space. But here there's a difference. Because imagine that I know that the, the state of the entirety of the air in the room is um, a pure state psi, and then I ask, well, what is the state of some little thing, some small part of it? Well, that's not going to be in general pure because it's a subsystem. So if it's entangled with the rest, it's going to be in general mixed. So having max information on the total does not give you max information on the bottom. And therefore, you do not need the equiprobable assumption to get the same typicality result. Um, so let me now talk about the actual typicality results. So there are two ones. So first is typicality. Uh, so, our setting is the following. I have a global system that I break into two parts. So I have S and I have E. So I have a Hilbert space that is HS tensor HE. Okay. Right. And now I start by saying I have some sort of constraint. So I say that I have some psi that is within an HR, which is a subset of, yeah, that's psi. So it's a pure state, so it's within HR, which is a subset of HS tensored HE. Okay. Now, again, a very simple example is I say, well, I know that uh, my state is an energy eigenstate within a certain band of energies. So then I restrict my Hilbert space. I take, I take the entire Hamiltonian, all of the energy states, and I just restrict myself to that band, and my psi is anywhere within that band. So that's, that's one example. Okay? And now I can define two things, given this. So I can define the, uh, let's call it omega s. So omega s which is trace over the environment of psi psi. So I take the pure state, and I trace it over the environment. So of course, I'm going to get something on, on S, and it's going to be, in general, a mixed state. So that's one thing. But the other thing I can also define is this state, epsilon r. Um, ah, no, sorry. Do, 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 do. Wait. Dynamic rho. No, sorry. Let me call this rho. This is rho s. Epsilon r is the following. So it's identity r over dr. OK. So this is a state on the system that I get by just actually tracing over the actual state I have. But there is another thing. Instead of taking the actual state, I could just take the maximally mixed state over the full restricted subspace. And then with that, I get another state of the system. And that's my omega s which is trace over the environment of epsilon r. Okay. Now, here I would link back to this equiprobable thing. We, um, we were given a constraint, which is a restricted subspace you could be in. And there are two things you could do. One of the things you could just go, oh, I make the equiprobable assumption. So I say that actually what I am is in a maximally mixed state of all of that. So I'm equally probable in this entire restriction. And then given that, I can calculate a state for the system. And the state of the system is just trace over that of the equiprobable state. But the other thing I can do is I can take a random state psi from within that, and I can calculate the actual reduced state from that random state psi. Okay? And now the point is, if I did this in classical mechanics, this would be extremely different.
because from the equiprobable state, we would get something that was our thermal or equilibrated state. But if I picked a pure state of the entire thing, I would get a very pure state of the, of the smaller system as well. So classically, we get something very different. And the point is that quantum mechanically, we actually get something that is not very different. And basically, the statement, so the approximate statement is that rho s is close to omega s. And the exact statement is the following. So the probability that, and I have the trace norm. You have done the trace norm in QIT, right? Yeah. The one I was very good. So the trace norm of rho s minus omega s one. So the probability of this being greater than eta is less than. So this probability is less than eta prime, where eta is of the following. epsilon plus square root of ds upon d effective, which I will define, and eta prime is 2 times e to the minus, there's just a constant here, 18 pi cube, and then there's dr, and then there's epsilon squared, and d effective, which I will talk about permanently, is 1 upon trace of omega e squared. So omega e is analogous. So omega e is trace over the system of that equiprobable state that we define, epsilon r. OK. Now, so epsilon r is, is the equiprobable state. Uh, Oh, the small epsilon. Oh, yeah, this is capital and, ooh, yeah. In, in, a, in, in the paper, it's fine because, of course, you can clearly make out the difference. So maybe I use something different. Let's call this theta. And this, I'm sorry. It's just, well, I'm trying to use the same language as that of the paper because I would recommend, and I, I will think in the lecture notes or in a note I will write on Moodle, I will give you the uh, links to these papers. Um, and it's, I recommend them highly as, uh, to be read because uh, they really explain from fundamental principles and intuition um, why the result is motivated. Um, yes, but of course, this notation is confusing. Right, so that's theta. Okay, so let's explain this a little bit now. So clearly the point is I want to pick... Um, one of the things you can immediately see is that the, the behavior with theta. If I pick theta to be extremely small, which means that I, I want my state to be very close to my, let's say, um, deduced state from the equiprobable thing, and so I pick theta to be as small as, as possible, then, of course, this is not going to be a very small number because if theta is very small, this is exponent of a small thing, so it's closer to 1, or multiplied by 2, so it's closer to 2, and that doesn't tell you much. So, of course, you, you see the fact that if I try and get too close, then the probability of that happening is it could be as high as I like. But for theta, at some point, if I make theta large enough, then this starts to scale down very much, and then I see that, well, actually the probability of being far away, further than theta from the state that I, I want it to be is actually getting smaller. Now, there are a few things to note in this. So first of all, even though I would like to pick my error to be theta, I have an extra error that is fundamental, which is ds by d effective. What is d effective? It's 1 over the trace of this squared. Now, this, uh, the reason that uh, this definition works is because if you think about it, so one of the fundamental properties of density matrices is that trace of rho is 1 and trace of rho squared is less than 1. However, it's not arbitrarily less, less than 1 because the maximum that you can make it is if you make, take rho to be identity over d and then you would get the trace of of rho squared would be basically greater, always greater than this value, 1 over d. So when, you're, when your state is maximally mixed, trace of rho squared is 1 over d. And now when you invert it, you will get that if this is a maximally mixed state, then d effective would actually be the dimension of, um, well, basically the dimension over which you're mixed. Why is this uh, important? Because imagine that I told you d effective was 1. Okay, So it's actually not very, the effective dimension of the environment is 1. 
That would mean that this reduced state on the environment was a pure state. But if the reduced state of the environment is a pure state, that means the reduced state of the, um, of the, of the uh, system is also going to be a pure state. Because I started out with a global pure state as well. Um, right. Yes, exactly. Which means that now I'm, I'm essentially getting, I'm, I'm not get, I'm, I, I have a division. Um, well, let me put it this way. If, my, if this is a pure state and the system is a pure state, it would mean that my restriction is actually so fine that I ended up with one pure state. And then I don't get my, um, my sort of equilibration result. Because I, my restriction is not over a sufficiently wide range such that I actually get a mixture of states. I'm, on, I'm only left with one state. So the first thing is that d effective has to be large, because if d effective is small, then I'm going to get a 1 here, and then my theta range is completely useless, because now I can always be of uh, distance 1 and go to any other state. So d effective has to be large to prevent that, that thing from happening. Um, yes. Now. The other thing that I haven't mentioned is I say probability, and I haven't essentially said how I pick. So this, what you do is you, when I said you pick a random state psi, what I mean is you pick a state psi by the Haar measure. So the Haar measure is essentially a way of giving volume to the state space for quantum mechanical systems. So that tells you, so if I say a uniform distribution of the Haar measure, for instance, is a uniform distribution over states, and picking a random state from HR is, is random with respect to the Haar measure. Okay, so that, uh, the end conclusion of all of that is to say, in quantum mechanics, when we have a restricted state space on a global system, and then I look at a subsystem of that, what I actually see is that for any pure, well, not for any, but for most of the pure states that I can pick for the big system, my little system is going to look very close to essentially the one, the, the state it would look like, as if I had just picked an equiprobable state. So I get the equiprobable assumption here for free. I don't have to start with it. I don't have to start with this one. It already follows that even if I started with a pure state, most of the time I would get something close to what I would have gotten from the equiprobable assumption. Now, so one of the other things to add to this to complete the, this, the link to the thermal state is, and this is now not something that's particularly quantum. It's also classical. If I was to pick epsilon r to be not not epsilon r but h r to be a uh, constant energy subspace. Um, and does have to be constant energy. It could have some of, of some width, of some small width, for example. So that's to prevent the case where you, you end up picking just one pure state, even though you have many close there. Then what you will find is that omega s will be proportional to e to the minus beta h upon z. And this is something that, in classical thermodynamics, you calculate. It's, the, it's one of the ways of deriving the thermal state, that if you start with constant energy on the global thing, um, you find that your state on the smaller one is indeed the thermal state. But the important thing here with the quantum result is you didn't have to start with the equiprobable thing. With a random state in that subspace, you're actually close to the Gibbs state. OK? Now. Oops, sorry. So that's typicality. Now let's do the last one, which is equilibration. Because everything that I've talked about so far is, well, so the first thing was about resources, but that's really an agent-based definition. Oh, I cannot extract work from this state, uh, no matter how many copies I have. Therefore, I, I call that a special state. That's the thermal state. Then we discussed Jane's principle. But that's, again, information theoretic. It, it's, it's just about static properties of the state. Also, typicality, it's all about static properties about the state. But we know in real life that the thermal state is, the fact that something is thermal is not a static property. If I leave a glass of water outside in the environment and it allow it to equilibrate, I know that when I come back later, I can say, well, I can describe this by thermal at some temperature. So the thermal state is something that arises in physical systems of their own accord. And so one of the most important questions is, can we show that this is the case? Can we understand why it is the case that we get the thermal state when things evolve? Yes? What is the typicality in information theory? Can you remind me? <laughs> OK, I'm, I'm not sure. I, do, I don't know what the, yeah? Hmm. 
Ajá. I, I don't know whether there is, well, I expect, I expect there is, but it might not be a direct one. It's more, so essentially both from Jane's principle and this, what you end up doing is you end up picking the state with the least information. And this is, I would say typicality information theory is also about that. You, when you have a, well, basically when you, when you have a sequence, you, you have your typical set because they're the set, they're, they are defined somehow as a set with, where you have the least amount of surprise in what you've gotten, whereas in the... Yes. Yes. And the disk, which is always uh, in the very last system, yes. this, this difference uh, goes to zero. So basically, the very last system is very probably a typical thing. A typical thing, yes. So I think, I think it would be very similar. The only thing I would say is that somehow, if I understand correctly, this, the proof of this one is quantum mechanical. So it, in, in, in a way, it, it, it relies on like, the linear algebra and stuff of Hilbert spaces, whereas in classical information theory, or, or are you talking about one that's also quantum? No. So it's, it's classical in that sense. So I think the, the, the tools would somehow be the same, that you have a set of, of results, and then when you look at sort of the set that's most probable, you, you find a result on that. Um, so I would say they both come from information theoretical arguments, but just applied in very different physical scenarios. So in that sense, there should be a yeah, connection. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't be able to say more, more than that. OK, so our final topic for today is that of equilibration. How is it that, so equilibration as opposed to typicality, equilibration is more a statement of, like in typicality I say, oh, most of the states will be close to my, my typical state. But now I ask the question, well, what if I started with a state which was special, that was just, it was actually not close to my typical state. So, you know, I have a box uh, with the particles filled, I mean, the um, gas particles inside, and I happen to know the precise initial state that all of the positions and velocities, except for one of them. One of them is like slightly uncertain. And I know now, just with this small uncertainty, that if I leave and I come back at some random time later, I'm going to know next to nothing again, because with the cause of collisions, I'll have lost the information. So this is now a different statement. It's like Even if I start in a state where I have a lot of information, I actually expect that a lot of the times I will lose this information and equilibrate towards something more standard, like the thermostate. So, the exact statement now. So let's talk about the scenario first. So imagine now I have the same scenario, but I'm going to use slightly different notation again to match the paper um, that has come from. Uh, this is S and this is B. B to refer to it as a bath. So I should say the, the papers that I'm referring to are in the range of somewhere 2000, there are a number of them, 2000 to 2009. And they have so short printed in it. So SQ short. I will write this in the, it's either already in the lecture notes, or if not, I will check and send you an email about it. Um, and then plus Linden. So I think there's one paper with three, and then there's the one I'm about to talk about with four, all of whom at the time were, so that's Sandu Popescu. Tony Short, Andreas Winter, and Noah Linden, all of, the, of which at the time were in Bristol. Currently, three of them are in Bristol. Uh, Andreas Winter is, where is Andreas? I'm, I'm not sure at the moment. He tends to have positions in many places as well. Um, okay, so here's the scenario. I have a, a large system of which I'm interested in a smaller component, and I have a Hamiltonian for the two of them together, so it's a joint Hamiltonian. And the joint Hamiltonian has the property that there are no degenerate energy gaps. Now, this is not the same as no degenerate energies. It's slightly different. Well, well, it also follows that there are no degenerate energies, but this is even stronger. No degenerate energy gaps means if I pick pairs of energy levels, I will never have one pair having the same energy difference as another pair. And why is this important? This eliminates the following scenario. It basically eliminates... H1, ten, well, HS tensor identity B plus identity S tensor HB. This is now eliminated by, by this condition. 
And the reason is very simple. Basically, if I pick, imagine I have a sum of two Hamiltonians. Then I can pick any energy level here, or any pair of energy level here, and one different two levels here. Well, let me actually do it in, in detail. So the easiest one is, imagine I have two qubits. So let's say this was my A and this was my B. And my joint Hamiltonian then, as we've drawn before, has these four levels. But of course, this gap is the same as this gap, because 0, 0 to 0, 1 will be the same energy difference as 1, 0 to 1, 1. So for every fixed state on, the, on A, I have a transition on B, and that will just have the same energy difference. So the moment I have some Hamiltonians, I will immediately have de degenerate energy gaps. So when I say I have no degenerate energy gaps, it immediately implies I cannot have some Hamiltonians, which means that there must be interaction. Okay. Now, it may, be, and it may be that this is too strong a constraint that you can have something that's... So because, for instance, this is not a two-way thing. If you have interactions, you could still have some degenerate energy gaps even in the presence of interactions. But, um, but this one, uh, so the other one doesn't go through. So this is a very strong condition. Why do I, why would one need this condition? Well, it's very simple. I'm going to argue that this system is going to equilibrate. But if this system is isolated from its environment, then this has no chance of equilibrating because it's not interacting with anything. So I have to already eliminate the very specific case where it's not interacting. Okay. Right. And then what we say is we define the following. So, so we have our rho system as a function of t. Okay? And we're going to define a time average state, which is the following. It's limit tau goes to infinity, 1 over tau, integral 0 to tau. Yeah. That's t. Yeah, it's really the literal literal translation of time averaging of the state. So from some t that you pick, t equals to 0, you find the average of the state, and then you really take the limit towards infinity. So this is a specific state that one could calculate given some initial state and, and some Hamiltonian. Okay, And the statement now, so the intuitive statement, is that the distance between rho s of t and omega S, oh, sorry, this does not require t. That's just omega s. That's, of course, the time average. The average of this over t is less or equal to half of ds over d effective of omega, omega b. Oh, that's... Well, okay. d effective omega b is just a different way of writing it which in turn is less than half of square root of ds squared over d effective omega. And, and the, uh, uh, I have to define these things now. So d effective, it's the same way as before. So d effective omega bar is equal to 1 upon trace of Omega b squared, and what is omega b squared? It's it's defined the same way, but it's defined on the state of the bath instead. So analogous to to the thing. Right. Okay. All right. So, uh, is this distance with respect to? So one of the things I don't immediately recall is whether this is the. Uh, with respect to the trace norm or the relative entropy, uh, I think it's probably the trace norm as well, but you can check that, or it is in the paper as well. But either way, it's some distance between the state that's evolving and the time average state. And now, what is this a statement on? This does not say anything for a particular time. So at some particular time, this distance could be as large as possible. So it could be as far from the state as possible. What it's saying is something about the average distance. So if you take the distance over some interval and then you average out, uh, and this, again, this over time is, again, over infinity. This is always going to be less than some quantity. And here, again, this quantity has the same properties as we saw last time. It depends on your system being small and your bath being large and the effective size of the bath, which you get by looking at, basically, the trace of this part when you, well, the part of the bath when you trace out the system, 
on that being large, which there are two different versions of it, but both essentially tell the same story. Here you have only omega of the bath. Here you have omega of the, of the full thing. And so, hmm? omega b is, is defined the same way, but it's on omega. So OK, let me write this down. So it's just 1 from 0 to tau, 1 over tau. Limit tau goes to infinity of rho b t dt. And rho b and rho s, of course, are trace over the joint uh, system of the, yeah, over time. OK? Um, and so if, if you think about this graphically, what this means is that imagine that I plotted this as a function of time. So I have d of rho s of t omega s. Right? And I, I plotted this as a function of time. This is something that can fluctuate wildly. So it can, it can say, be, be as large as something here. But for most times, it has to be small. Because in order for the average over time to be a small number, it must be the case that most times it is small with some fluctuations. So this is neat because on the one hand, we know that, so for instance, if I have a finite dimensional, a nice regular Hamiltonian of a quantum system for the global thing, um, a lot of times you have, well, you have the notion, even in classical mechanics, you have the notion of recurrence times. So if you allow a system that's isolated to evolve for long enough, then you could, you, every now and then you get close, back close again to your initial state. So if I start with a special state that is very different from the time average state, then I expect that sometimes it's going to get close to that state again. So there is going to be some recurrence and there have to be fluctuations. But what the statement is saying is, in spite of that, the, the, at the rest of the times or most of the times, it has to stay close to this average state in order for the average of that distance to remain small. And so this is now the dynamic part of what we were discussing, um, which is that uh, that even, even if you start in it, well, regardless of what state you start off with, you have equilibration. You have that for most of the time, it's going to be closed to your time average state. Now, what I haven't, con what we could continue with is again the argument that this omega s is, tip is typically something that's very close to the thermal state, and then that will give you equilibration towards the thermal state. Of course, only in the case when you pick your restriction to be of energy, you could pick it to be something else. But this already tells you that you have equilibration, regardless of what, whether you're in a thermal scenario or in another scenario. You're going to have equilibration as long as you don't pick an extremely specific structure such that you have a very regularity, regular dynamics here, or, of course, the trivial case where you have no interaction between the two. Go on. No, because of recurrence. So the point is, so uh, let's put it this way. If, if, your, if your system is finite dimensional, with a Hamilton is finite dimensional, then because it's finite dimensional, you, you, have, you always have recurrence times. So you always, so I, I mean, the extreme example of this was imagine that I took my Hamiltonian to be a, a ladder. So, so for example, my Hamiltonian is a regular space thing. And of course, the harmonic oscillator is an example of this. Then it's actually periodic. So in fact, in that case, you know that your, your graph will repeat in some time. Even if it's not regular and you have irregular gaps, you're still going to have recurrence in the sense that you will, you will, for any epsilon that you pick, there will be times at which you return within epsilon of your initial state. So you have recurrence. This, of course, is no longer true when you have infinite dimensions because then you, your, your space that you can traverse becomes infinite, so you can continue forever. But for any finite thing, you, yeah, you go there. So it's important that it is not necessary that the deviation continues to become small as you go in time. Classically, yes, because classically you typically deal with infinite dimensional systems. So then, yeah, you, you, you continually go closer and closer and never recur. Indeed, yeah. So indeed, I think the, the particle, the gas of particles in the example, even though if I start in a very specific state, I expect that there's a recurrence time. Formally, like when I actually calculate it, it will be practically infinite because it's too large. And also, it will interact with the environment, so you would never get a chance to recur. Yeah. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the major thing, so let's put it this way. Imagine that I had a Hamiltonian that was just the sum of B and, and some Hamiltonian and S, and there was no interaction. That would immediately mean that there are degenerate energy gaps. So, um, so let's put it this way. You have... So... If H of SB 
is equal to HS plus HB, and now I'm, I'm just omitting, so there's tensor identity, of course, always. Then you have instantly degenerate energy gaps. And so, of course, so you know with logical statements, if this implies that, then not that implies not this, which means that no degenerate energy gaps implies HSB is not equal to the sum of the individual Hamiltonians. So you've eliminated, basically with this, you immediately eliminate the case where there's no interaction. And, you, and that's important because if there is no interaction, then you, you cannot have equilibration. Because then how is it going to equilibrate when it's, its dynamics are independent of the environment? So that's essentially one of the reasons. Now, um, is there any other question? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's a good question. So what I was going to continue with was to say, so the two things that I've talked about are really, let's put it this way, that one of some of the first results in the direction of typicality and in the direction of equilibration for quantum mechanical systems. So when you make a first paper, the first thing you go is, well, can I find a condition in which I have the result that I, I would expect? And that was that one. Since then, there has been a lot of work done on, I think, equilibration in particular, because typicality is one thing, but then you want, you want evolving systems to have properties. And so now there are various statements with different starting conditions. So this is, a, as I said, this is a strong one. So with this, you immediately get, but you could have things that were less strong. You could have some more complicated description of the Hamiltonian that also ensures you don't have some Hamiltonians without requiring no degenerate gaps. Uh, also, so let me put it this way. Here, I make a statement on the basis of the state itself. So I say like the state itself is very close to something which in turn means that any observable of the state will also be close. But I could make something weaker. I could say, well, let me try for equilibration that's not on the level of the state, but on the level of observers or observables. So I say, well, I have a particular observable that I'm, I'm going to measure on this, on this system, and I ask whether the value of the result of that observable equilibrates. So that will not require the state itself to equilibrate, but just some reduced property of the state. So corresponding to typicality and equilibration, they are now much more complicated and uh, sub questions that you can ask one in weakening the conditions and still getting the same results and then the other in getting more specific results where you don't need typicality on the full state but just on observables or only for particular times etc cetera, etc cetera. and and then and that becomes a whole field like which which hamiltonians in many body physics demonstrate equilibration on the state equilibration on observables which observables how fast equilibration happens is size of chains and all of these things yeah but this is just a, sort of the initial result in that direction. Yeah. So. Um, OK, and so to conclude this lecture, yeah, I would return back to, yes, that one. So at the end of this lecture now, we've seen basically that our, our concept of a thermal state or equilibrated state in general has a sort of firm foundation from various different uh, ways of looking at it. One of the things I would mention is that for everything that I've said, like a resource uh, perspective, an information theoretic perspective, and the typicality and equilibration, um, we need not have that it comes from thermodynamics. So with thermodynamics, the typical thing is, oh, I have energy. Energy is my, my main thing. So from a resource point of view, I'm extracting energy. Information theoretic point of view, energy is conserved. Typicality of equilibration, my restricted space is uh, energy constant subspace. Um, but you could have other, other things. So one of the things is within thermodynamics itself, you can have more conserved quantities. So one e immediate example is number. You know, when I have superconducting devices and stuff like this where particles go through um, nodes, I have that the average, well, not the average, sorry, the global number of particles is, of course, a conserved quantity. And so because of that, I now have a new, like, con important quantity, which is the particle number. And so you could do all of these things with respect to particle number as well. So... It may, it may or may not be a total question, but one of the things, for instance, you can do is you can do Jane's principle, so the information theoretic thing, by saying, well, I have a state, and I know its average energy, and I know its particle number. What should the state be? And you end up getting something like, so rho is proportional to e to the minus beta h minus gamma n. And these are now both operators, h and n, the particle number operator and this operator. Of course, this is not the way we usually see it written in thermodynamics. We see it usually written as, if I'm not mistaken, h minus mu n. 
where mu is this is the chemical potential. But of course, I mean, mathematically these are equivalent. It's just gamma is equal to the minus beta mu, and it's it's the same. So you sort of see the what you get in that way as well. Um, yes, indeed, and of course. As um, one of the important things to um, to point out in all of this is, especially when it comes to the information theoretic thing, is what you end, end up ending up maximizing is always the entropy, and um, so basically this this quantity here, beta h, what you have in the beta h plus gamma n, this quantity becomes the important one, and this is this is somehow. This is somehow the quantity that's related to entropy. So one of the first things I will do in the next lecture is talk about the um, link between information and thermodynamic entropy. And of course, one thing you already remember from classical thermodynamics is so the S, the DS is usually defined as equal to dQ over T. And mathematically, this has the same form. I have a in, like beta is 1 over T, and Q is a change in the energy. So you always, when, whenever you have sort of the free states, the thermal states, you always have this quantity, precisely because this is the quantity that will appear in your expressions for entropy, essentially. Okay, so the one thing I did manage to get in this lecture, indeed, is, as I said, the link between information theoretic and thermodynamic entropy. I will start the next lecture with that. That's tomorrow. But then I will continue uh, tomorrow and the whole of next week. We're talking about autonomous thermal machines. So we'll talk about continuous thermal processes. So we'll write down uh, thermalization and interaction Hamiltonians, um, sort of the equivalent of the swap operation I started with, as a continuous process. We will build thermal machines out of that so that then, not next Wednesday, but the Wednesday after, you will have the guest lecture from Patrick, who will actually uh, construct or describe a construction of a thermal machine, I think an engine, possibly, on, um, on actual superconducting uh, circuit QED framework. So you will see a sort of an implementation of that. All right, and with that, I end the lecture. And uh, your tutorial will be, as usual, at 11.55.